Okay, so, uh, well, it's a great honor to speak here. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, I'm slightly, find it slightly stressful to speak in such a prestigious place. So thank you very much. I'm quite honored. And uh, so I also uh, uh, glad that I can talk in a conference in the memory of Jean-Christophe Yoko's uh, because uh, he really brought me a lot, uh, especially in the beginning of my career, uh, where um, <coughs> so he taught me firsthand uh, a very useful tool, uh, which were his estimates on sector renormalization, and uh, and the way he used them uh, uh, to prove one of his uh, famous theorems. Uh, on uh, linearization domains. So, well, I think you'll have to be patient and to listen me, to listen to me lecturing about how I met your course first before I talk about math. So, this happened in uh, the summer, during the summer of 1995. Back then, I was 20 years old and I was living at my parents' place uh, in the suburbs of Paris. And I, I had spent two years in preparatory schools and was applying to enter one of those, to try to enter uh, one of those prestigious schools uh, called uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure. So I had passed the written exams and uh, successfully, and I was, uh, called to come to Paris to pass the oral exams. And so I, I went to Paris on a beautiful summer day, and I went to this prestigious uh, high school called uh, Lycée Louis Le Grand, which is very close by. Uh, it's the nice building facing the Sorbonne in Rue Saint-Jacques. So I was, of course, very impressed, and I, I waited in the room. Uh, to pass the exam, and I entered in the room, and the examiner was Jean-Christophe. Uh, no, it was Henri IV. It was Henri IV. Ah, sorry, it's not so far away. <laughs> I never claimed it was Ecole Normale de Paris. <laughs> I never claimed it was Ecole Normale de Paris. So, <laughs> and thank you for, uh, yeah. So Henri IV is also a prestigious uh, high school, uh, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. And I was also very impressed anyway. So. <laughs> so we'll discuss this a bit later if you, you don't mind. <laughs> so if you want to know how the exam went, you, I invite you to go and read uh, the coming soon uh, issue of the Gazette de la SMF. Uh, it will be in French. Where I tell part of the story. Okay, so I, now let's go for the math. Okay. Uh, what time is it? Okay, so what is this about? Uh, oh yes, uh, one more thing before I start. Uh, when I was invited to the conference, I really didn't know who to expect in the audience. So I targeted my slides to uh, beginners in dynamical systems, students. So uh, the experts should know that they might be bored, but I won't apologize for that. So let's start. And uh, so I'm going to, well, I've been working for a long time on complex dimension one dynamical systems. So you can look at either discrete time or continuous time. So a continuous time dynamical system would be, in fact, an ODE, an ordinary differential equation, dz over dt equals chi of z. And holomorphic means that chi is a holomorphic function of, f, uh, of z. And uh, discrete time just uh, uh, would be written like this, a recurrence relation, and f is also a holomorphic function. 
Okay, so when does the point in phase, the phase space is a complex plane, when does the point not move? Well, uh, when chi of z equals zero or when f of z equals z, of course. And oddly enough, the name of such a point is not the same for vector fields and for holomorphic functions. In the first case, we call it a singularity. In the second case, a fixed point. Well, and so what's a parabolic singularity of fixed point? So if you replace the dynamical system by its first order uh, approximation, linear, uh, it means that the nearby points would not move, okay? It's a very fancy way of saying just that chi prime of z equals zero or f prime of z equals one for z, the fixed point. Okay, so let's look at uh, one example of a parabolic point. And uh, so here, okay, wait a second, let's start there. So let's assume that zero is the fixed point and then uh, by hypothesis, uh, the first non-zero term has to be a power of z that's higher than one. And if you rescale the variable, you may well assume that the first coefficient is one, unless chi is uniformly everywhere zero, but we don't want to look at this case. And similarly for f, you'll start like this. So then, uh, okay, so here's an example, a picture uh, of a vector field. So uh, the Directions of the little arrows that you may or may not see, depending on your eyesight and position in the room. Uh, this, the, the orientation is correct, but the, the size, of course, uh, I forced it to be constant for otherwise, those points there, uh, those, those arrows there would be too short, and those arrows there would go out of the screen, okay? So anyway, you can, you can, you can kind of uh, guess what, uh, dynamics of this vector field will be. There's uh, trajectories will, which will come from zero and come back to zero, and some trajectories that, well, uh, go outside and so on and so on. We'll see that in a minute. So <clears throat> one thing that's uh, not too hard to prove is that the dynamics is semi-conjugate to uh, this simple dynamics, which is a constant vector field equal to one. So the flow is Z maps to Z plus T, okay? T can be an integer or a real number, depending on continuous or discrete dynamical system. So you can semi-conjugate this or that to that by a change of variable that's not quite homomorphic. It's a, there's a slight subtlety here, and that's roughly uh, equivalent to this near zero. So minus one over k is e to the k, minus one over k is just a normalizing constant. And what's important is that what you do, you do uh, z maps to t, z to the k, which is a degree k cover of uh, the complex plane minus the origin. And then one over z, which is an inversion, which uh, sends zero to infinity, okay? So the trajectories of such a vector field uh, here, the trajectories are very simple. It's just horizontal lines and they foliate the complex plane. Well defoliate the plane. And then uh, if you invert this system of lines, you get this pencil of circles that are tangent to the real line uh, uh, at the origin, okay? And the positive real line is an attracting axis and the negative real line is a repelling axis. So um, then uh, if you pull this back again by z maps to z to the k, you get a, a the positive real axis becomes k attracting directions and the negative real axis becomes k repelling directions and the rest of the dynamics is like petals here, okay? So I'm supposed now to show a program there. So, okay, what does this program show? A Julia set uh, with the origin is green. This green dot is the origin. It's a parabolic fixed point with three attracting directions and three repelling directions. So uh, those white fjords there, they are the repelling directions. And so the program draws uh, an orbit. Well, you've seen thousands of programs like that probably before. But, and here you see uh, the attracting, one attracting direction, one attracting direction, one attracting direction, and so on. And, uh, and uh, I'm not going to define the Julia set here, sorry for that, but it's just for a background, <laughs> nice background for this dynamical system, okay? Uh, so, um, you see, as I vary the, 
the points, many, many, many points have an orbit that eventually is attracted uh, by one of the attracting axes, okay? To zero along one, tangentially to one of the attracting axes, of the three attracting axes. And if you zoom uh, near zero, uh, the, those attracting basin will take most of uh, what you see, in fact, okay? Well, that's a well-known fact, huh? Uh, yeah. At least, uh, okay. Here there's a thousand iterations, but it, the points barely move because uh, the s dynamical system is extremely slow, okay? So <laughs> that's also something to know that uh, it takes a lot of time, even with only three petals, it takes already a lot of time to escape. Anyway, that's not the topic here today, so I'm going to switch this off. Oh, this way. And let's go back here. So, next slide. Okay, so here I've drawn uh, two more things. First, uh, three, uh, a trap. A green set is a trap for the dynamical system. They are called petals, and uh, this index k over there is the number of petals. This is why I chose to, to write k plus one here instead of just k, because I prefer to count the number of petals than the order of, wait, whatever. So these are traps, and uh, the, the set of points whose orbit by the vector field here is uh, trapped by the trap, eventually enters the trap, uh, has a boundary which is in orange here. So these are uh, special trajectories of this vector field. So uh, these are kind of extended petals, if you like. And uh, I'm going a bit fast, but uh, sorry for that because I have lots of slides to show. So anyway, uh, by a change of variable, so now I'm going to speak of local classific classification, so by a change of variable uh, w equals phi of z or phi of z near the fixed point, uh, you can transform this vector field into this simple form. So what is this form? In fact, in fact, uh, it would, one would think we could kill all the terms ex except the first one, but it's not true. So ideally, we would like to have just w to decay plus one, but we can't. And there's an invariant that you cannot uh, remove, uh, okay, which in fact, if you take the one over chi, uh, you get the expression of uh, one form, holomorphic one form, and this form has a residue, and no change of variable will remove this residue. And this residue turns out to be A or minus A, or some simple function of A. Voila. Okay. So uh, now, in the realm of a discrete time dynamical systems, the situation is slightly more complicated. So you can still conjugate to this simple form. I just added, uh, well, z here, or w. But, in fact, only by a formal power series. So there is this uh, essentially, essentially unique formal power series that conjugates the dynamical system to this. And you cannot remove A, it's there, it's an invariant. But, usually this series is divergent. So, um, uh, in fact, if you look at the analytic, uh, uh, analytic uh, classification, you get uh, a countable set of invariants that I don't have time to present, but these are the ekal voronin invariants, or they bear also different names. Okay, so, one, uh, a couple more things before I start with uh, uh, the core of uh, this talk. So uh, I want to, what about comparisons between uh, vector fields and uh, discrete time dynamical systems? Well, one simple remark is if you have a flow with continuous time, you can restrict the flow to uh, integer values of the time. Okay, so from a vector field, you get a dynamical system just by taking the time one map. And the, fix, the singularities become fixed points and the parabolic singularity are uh, become uh, parabolic fixed points. Well, what about the converse operation? If you're given a dynamical system F, can you find a vector field whose time one map is F? The answer is usually no, okay? So not all parabolic points can be obtained uh, as the time one map of a dynamical system, of a vector field. Uh, in the parabolic case, it is possible if and only if all the non-formal invariants are equal to zero. 
which doesn't happen often. Okay, so, but in fact, we can find uh, good approximations of f, nevertheless, and they are useful to actually study, well, they are useful when you actually write proof of claims. Uh, it's very useful to first work in, co in a coordinate where this is adapted to a good approximation of f, and then they do things about f. So, well, those two fields are still very close. Okay, so one thing one should know is that it's very easy, in fact, to find straightening coordinates for holomorphic vector fields in dimension one. Because uh, just take the primitive of one over key. Yeah, oh, okay, I'm going to say primitive all the time. It means anti-derivative, okay? Uh, so, uh, dz over chi of z is a one form, just take any primitive, and those primitives are unique up to addition of a constant. So in fact, this gives you a coordinate system in which the flow just becomes the translation by t, and the change of charts in these coordinate systems are translations. So you get a translation surface, and uh, the, on the complement of the singularities, not on the whole phase space, but just on the complement of the singularities. Can you do the same for a discrete time dynamical system? Almost. So, if you have got a parabolic point, you can conjugate to this holomorphically, but not on the whole neighborhood or puncture neighborhood of the origin, but only on some domains, sectors or petals. And if you want to compare two such uh, coordinates, you don't get a translation, in fact, how much you're different from the translation is exactly those analytic invariants I was speaking of. Okay, so all this has been well known for some time anyway, uh, generic perturbation. So now that's the core of the, the, the talk, okay. Uh, parabolic, sorry, uh, yes. So I'm going to look at perturbations of a parabolic point for a vector field. Uh, now, uh, so my uh, vector field now is parameterized by uh, some complex number that I call epsilon because I want it to be close to zero. And um, I'm asking that the perturbation is an analytic perturbation. So it means precisely that the map of two variables, epsilon z, complex variables, epsilon z, maps to this number is uh, analytic. So now here's a Newton diagram. So uh, it represents the coefficients of the power series expansion in two variables of this difference of between uh, the, the, per the perturbed uh, vector field and uh, the one we started from. And uh, so uh, the hypothesis uh, on chi naught is that all the coefficients vanish at the beginning and the first one is e to the k plus one, okay? So, the philosophy of the Newton diagrams tells us that the next important coefficient must be the one in this corner here, epsilon, okay? For if this doesn't vanish, uh, all the other coefficients as a first order approximation of the dynamics uh, can be neglected. Of course, there's some importance, but well. So I want now to define a generic condition, so I'm asking that this coefficient, A01, well, doesn't vanish. So it means that uh, this, uh, when epsilon has some magnitude, this difference has this magnitude. Anyway, position of the singularities. Uh, okay, so our vector field, or dynamical system, starts with this, and there are higher order terms that I claim can be neglected, okay? So uh, what about now the singularities or fixed point of this? Well, it's like solving this equals zero. So Okay, take a k plus first root of uh, a constant times epsilon, you're going, you're going to get a regular n gon, k plus one gon, okay? But the singularities are not exactly on these vertices, okay? They are approximately, so this is why normally this should be close to a regular hexagon, but not quite exactly a regular hexagon. So there's another situation that has been much more studied, studied in fact, uh, if it's when uh, the, 
in the case of dynamical systems, not vector fields, when f is the case iterate of a map and uh, the map for epsilon equals zero fixes the origin and the derivative is a primitive case root of unity. <sighs> well, and g epsilon, and we are in a generic situation for these conditions, say, that I'm not going to precise, to specify here. So for some generic condition, uh, you'll have a set of positions of the fixed point that's, uh, so here I took the same value of k, five, but here you get a six gon, and here you get a pentagon and a center. What happens in fact is that this map has a fixed point at the origin, and when you perturb this map, it still has only one fixed point at the origin. But uh, those points form a cycle for G. In fact, they are a fixed point for the kth iterate of G. And this dynamical system is somewhat simpler because it has some symmetry. If you rotate by one-fifth of a turn, well, uh, at the first approximation, you'll get the same dynamical systems. And much more precisely, in fact, this map f commutes with g epsilon. So g epsilon is a rotation of f epsilon. Whereas, uh, whereas in, in this in, uh, situation, we don't have this symmetry. Uh, okay, so good. Here, you won't have an order six symmetry of the dynamical system. Okay, so what happens next? And by the way, the, I don't think this simple situation has been studied before. I'm not aware of that. So if one of you knows, uh, please inform me, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, uh, now or later, okay? So, so here's, uh, okay, if we want to understand what happens in the general case, it's good to look at the simple example. So let's look at this simple example. The vector field is e to the k plus one minus epsilon. There's no other terms. I chose minus here for convenience. So uh, recall epsilon is complex and you have a interesting picture. Why? Because far away from the origin, you don't see this epsilon. The vector field behaves like the k plus one. And this vector field has k attracting directions and k repelling directions. On this picture, I chose k equals six. So six attracting directions and six repelling directions. But uh, it has k plus one singularities near zero, seven singularities near zero. So you see, those two symmetries don't fit together well. So there's an interesting problem to look at. Uh, how does this fit together? And when, well, intuition tells that the argument of epsilon will be important, okay? So for instance, here's an example. Okay, so red, the red curves are trajectories that reach infinity. Every trajectory that hits infinity must do it so in finite time. All the other trajectories will exist for infinite time. And the same is true backwards. So the blue curves are those that hit infinity in backward time, and they do so in finite time. So there's exactly six outgoing uh, separate, uh, so those curves are called separatrices, uh, and uh, they, there are six repelling separatrices and six attracting separatrices. And uh, it's interesting to look at how they fit together, okay? so this particular fixed point singularity, I mean, uh, attracts two uh, incoming uh, uh, separatrices, and this one also, this one also, and for the uh, repelling ones, well, two repelling separatrices uh, go in backward time to deal this a uh, singularity, this one also, but this one has only one, and this one has only one, okay, so. So, in fact, studying this uh, simple model of the dynamical system is, I find it quite pleasant and quite fun, albeit for a definition of fun that's a bit particular, but yet uh, I think, uh, well, I hope you can share also this. Uh, uh, so, here, uh, the gray trajectories are defined for all times. 
in the future and the past. And they must converge to a singularity. Uh, because none of those singularities will be neutral. So there won't be closed loops. And for holomorphic vector field, there's a very strange phenomenon that you can't have limit cycles when the vector field is holomorphic. I'll let you think about this. So anyway, so here, if you look at the middle part, all those trajectories seem parallel. That's because, in fact, uh, this becomes much smaller than this. So it's like the vector field by minus epsilon. So here, every point is pushed towards the lower uh, left uh, corner of the screen, OK? And all those three singularities on this side are attracting, and all those four singularities on that side are repelling, OK? There's probably a good reason for that. Anyway, now I'm going to speak of the duadi Santenac invariant, invariant, because they have studied a lot uh, polynomial vector fields, and this turned out to be a polynomial vector field. So what is this invariant? It's a combinatorial invariant that's defined as follows. So it's a graph embedded in a plane. And the vertices of the graph are the singularities. So seven vertices in this case. And you draw an edge. Well, there will be an edge between two singularities if and only if uh, there exist uh, great trajectories like this defined for all times in the past and the future, such that, that tend to one singularity in the future and to the other one in the past. Okay, so here there is a, pa a gray curve from this one to this one. So there's in the combinatorial invariant an edge from this vertex to this vertex. Pardon? Do you call that a directed edge? Oh, so I'm asked whether these are directed edge or not. So you can, you can require that, that they are directed indeed, indeed. But I think the, they defined a non-directed graph, as far as I remember. OK, so uh, then uh, there is an edge from here to here, OK? <coughs> And uh, from here to here to here, something like that. It's probably a bipartite graph. Uh, I have to think a little bit, uh, but something like that must be true. So here, the graph is very simple. It's a line with dots at the extremities and in the middle. OK? So, OK. So let's analyze this a little bit further. And you'll, you may. Uh, believe maybe that the analysis will be extremely simple because, in fact, we have an explicit formula for straightening coordinates, which just take the primitive of one over the vector field. So one over the vector field is a rational function. You can decompose it in simple elements, and you'll get, for the straightening coordinates, a sum of logarithms, complex logarithms. So now you realize that it might be a bit complicated because of those monodromies around, and that maybe the formula are not the good approach this. So let's start over and forget about the formula. And instead, I'm going to uh, draw straight lines from uh, the singularities. They lie on a regular hexagon, right? Because I've taken this ideal vector field. I slid the plane along those dotted lines. And I now take one primitive of uh, one over my vector field on this simple connected open set, simply connected open sets, that uh, doesn't contain any singularity. The complement of the lines doesn't contain any singularity. And this is what I obtained. So I must be a bit more specific. The image by this change of variable of this shape will be whatever is inside this star-shaped domain. And um, it turns out this, that this change of variable is injective and commutes with the translation, no, the rotation by 1 over k plus 1. So uh, in fact, the geometric picture is pretty simple somehow. So there's a strip, for instance, and uh, you have to glue the two sides of the strips together by, the by a translation going this way because in fact, those two sides correspond to the two sides of this dotted line. Okay? So it 
requires some effort of imagination, but this Z0 singularity is pushed to infinity by the change of variable. Uh, and this Z1 also is pushed to infinity, but in another direction. So when you glue this and that, you get some kind of cylinder that will uh, be, in fact, a neighborhood of Z0, OK? Ah, I tried, OK. So, and, and similarly, and oppose in opposite direction, uh, infinity is cut in six parts, and uh, they are mapped to finite points, points at finite distance in this coordinate. Now let's analyze the flow of the vector field, because in this coordinate, the flow is supposed to be the translation, horizontal translation by T. So it should be very simple to analyze the vector field in this coordinate. So I've drawn a few trajectories. So these trajectories are faithful, OK? So it's been computed uh, precisely, OK, using this formula in particular. And so there I get, so you have to think a little bit to, to know who, it's go, who goes to, to what. So here's this incoming trajectory going to Z0, correspond to this horizontal line here. It's coming from infinity, OK, in finite time. And it reaches this edge there, but you have to glue this to that, so it continues there. And it will, it will do that forever. And so it means that this trajectory will intersect this dotted line infinity many times. But you don't see the intersection because it happens so close to the point. Okay. Anyway, and so on. And you can uh, proceed to the whole analysis. So this infinity has an incoming and uh, outgoing uh, 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 separatrices because this infinity between Z2 and Z3 corresponds to this infinity here. And you see there are two separatrices indeed. So it seems to be coherent, right? And so you can try it for yourself. And I find this quite fun, in fact. So now I'm going to turn to the next slide. Yeah? So would it be fair to say that this just turns the uh, dynamics of the vector field into the straight line flow of the class surface? Yes, yes. The, this picture, so for those who would not have heard, uh, this, this, the, the dynamics of the vector field is conjugate by this change of variable to the flow of the translation by T on this flat surface, translation surface. Indeed, indeed. So next, um, OK, I forgot what's the content of this slide. Sorry for that. So uh, rescaling, yes, OK. So we want to analyze now the bifurcation of the prototype when epsilon varies. So for that, uh, First remark, we can assume that modulus of epsilon is equal to 1. Just by rescaling space to put the singularities at the right place, and time, because uh, it will go faster or slower. OK, so now we have only one parameter. And when epsilon makes one turn around 0, each singularity will make 1 over k plus 1 turns. So they will exchange place, but we will have the same epsilon, so the same vector field. Nevertheless, it is not true that the vector field is invariant by the rotation by 1 over k, as I already remarked. So the right thing to compare is the direction of epsilon with the direction of the singularities. And uh, this angle uh, is all you need. So in fact, you can reduce the space of uh, parameter to uh, the interval from 0 to 2 pi over k, uh, because this is uh, what will happen when you compare those two angles. Also, there's another symmetry. That's uh, the complex conjugation. So you can further reduce this uh, interval of angles by a half. OK, so here I'm going to quickly uh, uh, describe the bifurcation. So uh, here's what happens when theta equals 0 for k equals uh, k plus 1 equals 5. So there's uh, two attracting, uh, two uh, blue uh, separatrices coming to this point, and uh, two outgoing separatrices to this point, and so on, etc. Okay, that's the situation. Now we increase theta, and now it's between 0 and pi over 8, so a turn over 16. And, um, 
So those trajectories have been deformed, but the dynamical system is conjugate. There is an isotopy of the complex plane that follows the dynamics. So there's no bifurcation. But now, when you reach exactly uh, a turn over 16, what you get is uh, that the blue trajectory here and the red trajectory here have merged. So there is now a homoclinic curve, uh, so which means that this uh, green curve is tending to infinity in positive time and in negative time. Okay, and this happens exactly for that kind of angles. Here, two homoclinic connections happen at the same time. Uh, okay, that's life. And, and uh, so th that's the picture. And this point has become natural. So neither attracting nor repelling, it's a rotation. Okay. So, yeah. And if you go beyond, in fact, it will be a, a situation that's symmetric to this one. So, and then we come to a situation that's symmetric to this one, except that it has become red anyway. It's not so important to have understood this picture to understand the rest. So I'm going now to uh, treat the other case when k plus one is even. even. Uh, so here is six. And now there's another kind of bifurcation. So for theta equals zero, you have a bifurcation. So before, during, after. Okay, and here it's another kind of bifurcation where the homoclinic connections are slightly different combinatorially. You can see. So I like those pictures, they are kind of simple and nice and well anyway. So but simple doesn't mean uninteresting, right? So now we are complicating a slightly uh, the study. We still look at the, this idealized vector field that's very simple, x to the k plus one minus epsilon, but instead of, of, instead of looking at the dynamics on the whole complex plane, I want to look at the dynamics restricted to the unit disk or to some disk. And uh, when does this dynamical system bifurcate, okay? Or when is it structurally stable? So stable means that there's an isotopy that will follow the dynamical system. And uh, bifurcation means that uh, you're not in the stable set. So what's the bifurcation set in the epsilon space? Okay, so now the modulus of epsilon is important because the distance of this uh, singularity to the boundary will have some influence, mild influence, but yet. Okay, so what you do, oops, sorry, is, what, what is that? Okay, so this uh, is, for instance, okay, I'm going too fast. So the separatrices were curves hitting infinity in final time, in forward or backward time. Well, now there's no more infinity, so the infinity is the boundary of the circle. So a separatrix will be a curve hitting the boundary of the circle in final time. And uh, well, it's, it's, you see it's not just one trajectory, but a whole bunch, continuous bunch of trajectories that hit uh, the boundary, and there's uh, incoming and outgoing separatrices, exactly like uh, in the case where the radius is infinity. What about the connections? So the connections are trajectories going from the boundary to the boundary in finite time also, and they also come in bunches, and in fact you have to, well, I'll say it later. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, you have Okay, you have to think a little bit to understand those pictures, right? But, uh, well, it, it, it's a nice exercise. So that's the picture on the right on the, from the last slide. And here's the linearizing coordinates. The linearizing coordinates are exactly the same. And the image of the unit circle is now a set of five curves. Well, it's one curve, but this is glued to that. This is glued to that and so on, okay? And those curves are not exactly circular, but very close to be circular. When epsilon tends to zero, they tend to a circle, an uh, arc of circle, each of them, of diameter that tends to a constant, but the distance between those arcs of circles gets to infinity, in fact, 
Okay, so this distance this gets to infinity, this distance gets to infinity, but the diameter of these curves converges. Okay, so when can, how can we detect a bifurcation? So I claim, and I'll let you think about that again, that there will be a bifurcation whenever, for instance, uh, the lowest point here on this curve is this black dot, and the highest point on this curve here is this black dot, when they have the same height, there will be a structural instability in the vector field. But when this doesn't happen anywhere, then it is structurally stable, okay. So now we are bound to a very simple problem to evaluate what is the set of epsilon such that two points like this have the same height, the highest and the lowest or things like that. So when does this happen? Well, to make it, to keep it short, I'm not giving a proof, but just a statement. So here, uh, it happens locally for epsilon small enough, it happens on analytic curves uh, that are like that and described a bit more precisely here. So they are organized into groups that tend to zero along two, sorry, that should not be D here, along two K directions that are evenly distributed and each group contains at least three curves. Here it's five. One of them is a straight curve for the ideal vector field, not for the general vector field, for the ideal vector field. And uh, what else? The, uh, yes, any two curves uh, in a bunch here, uh, finitely many, huh? uh, any two curves have an order of tangency at the origin which has been computed here. Well, next. Uh, now we would like to classify vector fields. So let's go to the general case for vector fields. I'm still assuming that we are perturbing a parabolic point in a generic way. And uh, then uh, there will be equivalent if and only if their multipliers can be matched to match. Sorry, uh, multiplier, I did not define it. It's the derivative of the vector field at the singularity. It's also called a Nigen value, in fact. Multiplier is not the right term. It should be called a Nigen value. So when you have a singularity, the derivative of this, uh, so the function chi vanishes at some point, but the derivative of chi takes some value. Uh, that's called the Eigen value. So if two vector fields have the same Eigen values, are they equivalent? Well, this is not true in full generality. It will be true locally for non-parabolic points, for instance, I think. Uh, not so sure, anyway. But uh, in this case, since we are perturbing families, I'm sure of that, uh, uh, you can conjugate those two families uh, on the whole neighborhood of the origin, provided epsilon is small enough, and the eigenvalues are the same for the two families. Because I forgot to tell it, but if two families are conjugate, or two vector fields are conjugate, they must have the same eigenvalue at the singularity. Okay, so now the change of variable and parameter means just that I'm going to change parameter, so epsilon hat is phi of epsilon, and change variable by a change of variable that depends on epsilon, okay? So it's kind of fibered, if you like. Okay. So now for each epsilon I associate, to each epsilon I associate a set lambda of epsilon, big lambda of epsilon, which is just the set of eigenvalues as the k plus one singularities that are close to zero. What happens next? Well, uh, if I perform a change of variable of parameters like this, I get a new function lambda hat and they are related exactly by this relation. You just compose by phi, phi, whatever, okay? Conversely, that's a theorem because it's not obvious at all. Uh, given two families, chi and chi tilde, as before, so with a parabolic point with the same k and that are generic in the sense that I define, okay? If there exists a chain of parameter, call it phi of the epsilon, such that this relation holds, okay, for epsilon small enough, then 
those families are conjugate by a local change of variable which for this phi. Exact, the phi here is exactly the phi here. Okay? Okay. So I'm not going to prove this theorem, but it wasn't completely obvious to, to prove, so it required some work. And in fact, Christian and I started to uh, think about this and wanted to work quickly on the dynamical systems case, which is a complication of that. But writing all this uh, took us a lot of time, and now we have a 50 pages paper that we have submitted, and uh, well, so, and we hope now to address the dynamical systems case uh, in the near future, okay? So, let's now uh, make uh, one remark before uh, drawing consequences from the theorem. So the remark is that you can, ah, sorry, uh, always find a change of variable, well, assuming that the family is generic, generic, uh, you can always find a change of variable, the hat, depending on the parameter, such that the singularities are exactly mapped on a regular Q plus one gram, okay? Uh, this is a simple lemma, in fact, that's uh, valid for any set of solution of, uh, well, anyway, uh, I'm not going to, to, to give you the proof, so I'm not going to comment. So, uh, but that makes the study a bit simpler because given any generic family, I can first change variables so that I have the situation. And then this will give me information on what this set can be, okay? So let's draw the consequence now. Under the same assumptions, the set of eigenvalues lambda has this form. It's the set of values of some holomorphic function lambda at the k plus one root of epsilon, right? K plus first root of epsilon. So, uh, and eta turns out to have a root of order exactly k at the origin. Conversely, all such function lambda can arise as the lambda of epsilon of some vector field. And here's the proof in the very short. Uh, so using the previous theorem. So if, uh, so first this direction. So you have uh, some uh, vector, family of vector field that's generic. Uh, so you first change variable using this lemma. And then you know that lambda uh, of epsilon the set of eigenvalue is exactly the same after the change of variable, but after the change of variable, it's just taking the derivative of chi at the roots of epsilon. Now, you can factor chi by this thing, because it vanishes there, and uh, by a simple computation, you get this claim. Conversely, if you're given a function lambda like this, you just define this explicit vector field, and it will have exactly this set of eigenvalue, you see, that's very short proof using the previous theorem, right? Okay, it also proves that uh, this vector field will be conjugate to this family of vector fields. Kind of interesting, this can be seen as a normal form, if you like. Okay, great. So, um, okay, uh, okay, I'm doing fine. So, we can draw consequences uh, in terms of moduli space, and as I just told you, normal forms. So, for instance, what's the set of all, what do I mean by a moduli set? So, I want to uh, look at the set of all uh, generic vector fields, like I defined, uh, generic families of perturbation of a parabolic point, like I defined, modulo, uh, this equivalence relation, which is change of variable and parameter. So what does this uh, tell us? That um, in fact, uh, uh, to get a model of the Moduli space, you just get, look at all the functions lambda uh, that have a root of order k at the origin, and you identify two of them whenever there exists a change of variable uh, such that this set is the same. So if you want a set that contains 
only one representative of each class, it's not so easy. But I can give you a set that contains exactly k plus one representatives, or sometimes less, uh, uh, voila, at most k plus one, at most k plus one representative, representative for each class, it's this set. So you take those functions lambda and you uh, let the first coefficient to be one, and then the other coefficients can be anything except that there should be no coefficient for n plus one being a multiple of k plus one. Okay, that's just some normal form. But there is k representative because in fact uh, you should Id identify here two elements exactly when there is a rotation by a, a k plus first root of unity. Uh, such that you have this composition. Uh, sorry, yes, yes, this, exactly that, okay? Mm. Okay, maybe I wasn't clear from the face of, <laughs> okay, let me say it again. So here, uh, to, if you start from a map of this form and compose it with uh, the multiplication by a k plus first root of unity, you get another element here, that's equivalent. Voilà, this is my claim. Because the set of values of lambda at the k plus first roots of epsilon will be exactly the same if you multiply by this rotation. Okay. Well, and also you can uh, draw uh, consequences for normal forms, uh, like for instance, this is a normal form, if you like, every uh, vector field with uh, those uh, standing hypothesis that it's a generic perturbation of a parabolic point we can be put into this form by a change of variable and parameters. Uh, and and Q, Q is a polynomial of degree at most k and Q zero of zero equals one and that kind of things. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on, on that. Also, I don't have time to uh, tell you about the proof of the theorem. Uh, so the theorem, what did the theorem say? So let me recall. If you have two families of vector fields that are generic perturbation of parabolic point, uh, and if they have the same eigenvalues, then you can, at least locally, find a change of variable and parameters showing that they are locally equivalent. So how are you going to build that change of variable and parameter? In fact, you will build an isomorph isomorphism between the translation surfaces but you cannot do it on the whole of a uh, translation surface. You have to, to take a subset of the translation surface, and if you can conjugate them, then you're done. Basically, this is that, so what do you do? Well, you first do this change of variable that puts all the singularities on a regular and k plus one gone, and then you cut uh, the plane exactly like we did, but you also cut a sector, look at the image, here's the colors match, you don't have to understand this picture either, it's just to give you the, a taste of the proof, right? You glue those pieces together and you, kind, you try to identify one technical complication that took us time to figure out is that uh, uh, you, let's look at those identification between those two lines there. So those two lines, let me recall you, correspond to uh, some curve here from the boundary of the unit disk to uh, this point here. It won't have to be a straight curve, so it will be some, uh, some curve from here to here. And uh, you have to glue the two sides of these curves, and this gluing is exactly a translation here. And it's a translation by two pi i over the residue, no, times the residue of the, uh, how is it called, uh, one form, uh, which one form? Well, take one over the vector field. Remember, a vector field, key of z, if you introduce d0 over key of z, it is naturally a one form, holomorphic one form, it has residues at the singularities, and this two pi i times the residue uh, is exactly the translation that you must perform to glue those two sides. Now the sum of the residues doesn't have to be zero. It would be convenient. It was the case in the ideal vector field. 
But now it's not the case anymore. In fact, the sum will tend to this constant A that we have, or minus A, or something like that. So, but, so if we want to build this canonical geometric model, you have, this is why this is messy here, okay? This part is messy exactly because of that. Okay, so this was my comment, and then uh, you'll think about that, or look uh, at our article in the archive. This may happen too. So, uh, what's coming next for the near future? We would like to use those vector fields to get uh, nice coordinates to work with, to now classify, to give the same classification theorem, but for discrete time dynamical systems. So, now, there will be a complication because uh, these uh, horn maps or Ekalvorini invariants will enter into the game in a way that I don't quite understand, but uh, Christiane Rousseau is a specialist of that, so I hope to learn from her and that we can uh, classify this soon. Also, uh, another consequence which I would like to uh, draw from all this, and uh, I'm more a specialist of that, uh, is on a bifurcation loci, and I will uh, finish uh, my uh, talk, so uh, showing a few pictures of bifurcation loci. loci. So first, let me define what is a bifurcation locus. Okay, so take a family of discrete time dynamical systems, and I'm now asking that F is a rational map, so now I call it R. Uh, it still depends analytically, analytically on epsilon. Uh, they all have, this, have the same degree d. And uh, uh, what do we call the bifurcation locus? It's a subset of the parameter space. The parameter space is just the set of values of epsilon. So B, the bifurcation locus, is a subset of the parameter space defined as the complement of the stability set. So what is the stability set? So it's the set on which, uh, locally, uh, there is an isotopy that will follow the Julia set and also uh, an isotopy that commutes with the dynamics. I did not define the Julia set and I'm not going to define it, sorry for that. Uh, that's the set where the dynamical system is chaotic. So, chaotic. So now, uh, the most famous example of bifurcation locus is not the bound double set, but it's the boundary of the bound double set. Okay, for the ma family of maps, R epsilon equals C squared plus epsilon, but usually it's called C. Okay. I'm not going to show a picture of the bound double set either. So the bifurcation locus has been studied and characterized by Magnesad and Sullivan in, in a very important uh, uh, article. So, uh, the complement of the bifurcation locus is called S, is the stability set. And they prove in particular that it's open, dense, and locally in some sense, it's the intersection of the stability set associated to each critical point. A rational map has at most 2D minus 2D plus two critical points. And uh, so locally you can parameterize it as a function of epsilon or a root of epsilon. And now, uh, if the, you so look at those functions, it's a family of functions indexed by n, which uh, to epsilon associates the nth iterate of the critical point number i. So these are, uh, well, we're looking at one value of i, so it's one family indexed by n. So if this family of functions is equicontinuous in a neighborhood of this epsilon that we are looking at, we say that we are in the stability set of this critical point. And theorem of Magnesad and Sullivan, in particular, S is the intersection of SI near this epsilon. Okay, so let me finish this talk by showing a program that shows bifurcation sets for debifurcation set for this family. So it's been chosen so that there's for epsilon equals zero, it's a parabolic point with three attracting petals, k equals three, k plus one equals four. And I wanted some complications, so I added uh, a degree to five term. But on the first order, the dynamics is dominated by those terms, okay? So this was, in fact, for epsilon equals zero, 
this uh, Julia set that we saw here. So let me just uh, mention that the white set is the basin of attraction of infinity for this dynamical system. You can kind of see it when I look at any point in the white set, it, it will escape some neighborhood of the origin. Uh, well, it will go to infinity. Uh, the gray set is whatever doesn't go to infinity, but I'll also have a algorithm that I did not invent, but that's able to detect many points on the boundary and draws them in, in black. Okay, the boundary between <coughs> the boundary of the uh, basin of basin of attraction of infinity. Okay, so then the origin is this green point, and there are four critical points because the polynomial has degree five. <coughs> There's also a critical point at infinity, but uh, it's fixed, so it doesn't mess with the dynamics. And there are pictures here uh, in a kind of purplish color, okay, magenta. So, well, see, two of the critical points belong to the same basin of attraction of this petal. And there's a theorem of Fatou saying that each petal must have at least one critical point in its basin. Okay. So here I took a, I chose this constant big A in the formula here so that this happens, that there's two. So it's just for illustration purposes. So now I'm going to show the parameter space. So this picture is messy. And why is it messy? Because there's uh, four critical points, but only one uh, dimension uh, for the parameter space. So here uh, I've drawn in gray the bifurcation locus for each critical point, and whenever two of these bifurcation local uh, log psi intersect, uh, uh, it's darker. Okay, so black means all critical points bifurcate, and light gray means only one bifurcate, and white means stability. So the origin is there where the flag is planted. And so I can zoom on the bifurcation set. OK, here I've zoomed. Please ignore those uh, magenta lines. Uh, they are uh, computation artifacts. But they are useful because they, uh, in fact, outline uh, special parts of the boundary of the bifurcation sets that correspond to one point being neutral. So let me choose the parameter slightly off the origin, like there. Well, so what ha has happened is that this origin, which was the fixed point, has, is now no, not anymore fixed because we, I have added epsilon to my polynomial. So let's look at the dynamical system. It goes slightly 45 degrees, okay. And uh, apparently it's attracted to this. So these are the fixed points now. Well, some of the fixed points. And uh, you see, uh, we had four fixed points at the origin, but they have exploded in this almost square figure, okay? Uh, like I explained, and the dynamical system looks like the vector field. And here, what do we have? Well, maybe you kind of recognize one of these homoclinic, con con homoclinic connections, right? Well, I'm, all, I'm almost done. Um, so it, it's like the homoclinic con connection, and this point is almost neutral. Okay, this is why in the parameter space we were on this pink thing, but there are also some directions where there's bifurcation coming in without a neutral points. And okay, so if you zoom a lot, this picture will look like the other bifurcation picture for the ideal vector field. Okay, so uh, now I want to draw to know how much this is true and how much this is false, because it's not completely true, right? And also, if you, so if you zoom at one of these parts and uh, plant the flag, I'm trying to do all this in one minute, um, voila. So I've zoomed a lot on the bifurcation locus on one of those lines, and I plant the flag on some uh, bifurcation points. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think that's correct. What has happened is that this critical point goes through there, 
and this is like a homoclinic. We are very close to this homoclinic connection. And once it has done that, it could get out very close to this or very close to that or in between. So it's now very sensitive to the parameter. Okay. And this is basically where we get a bifurcation and I'm going to uh, end my talk here. Thank you.